Well, our next speaker uh, will be telling you about MEN1, MEN2. Anybody has this alphabet here? MEN1, MEN2? They're a rare tumor, but they are very important. Uh, so I can see the three, four hands going up. So our next speaker is uh, from University of Iowa, a good friend of mine, Jim Howe, who will be talking about eyelid cell tumor, MEN1 and M2, rare tumor and rare syndrome. Jim? Thanks, Bill. All right, well, thank you for this opportunity to, to talk to my favorite group of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And, uh, we're not going to talk about new therapies. We're just going to talk about these syndromes and try to educate you about what's involved in each one of them. And so we should probably start by talking about the systems that are involved, and that is the endocrine glands. And when we talk about endocrine glands, we talk predominantly about the thyroid gland, which sits on your windpipe and regulates your body's metabolism. The parathyroid glands, which sit behind the thyroid, and they regulate calcium homeostasis in your blood. Your adrenal glands, they make adrenaline. They also make cortisol and aldosterone, which are important hormones. The pancreas, we've talked a lot about the pancreas. It's an organ that makes digestive enzymes, but it also makes insulin and a variety of other hormones. And uh, there was the pituitary was on there, but uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit later. The, the, the syndromes that are, we're predominantly going to be interested in are called multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. And that's where patients get tumors of the parathyroid glands, of the pituitary glands, and of the pancreas. MEN2, where people get medullary thyroid cancer, pheochromocytomas, and hyperparathyroidism. And there are three different subtypes we'll talk about. And then there are a couple syndromes where patients get inheritance of pheochromocytomas. Again, this is a neuroendocrine tumor in the adrenal gland that gives rise to uh, an adrenaline secreting tumor, and that's von Hippel-Lindau, and that and multiple other tumors are associated with that as well, including pancreatic islet cell tumors. And there's neurofibromatosis, uh, where people also get pheochromocytomas, but other tumors as well. And finally, hereditary paragangliomas, where people get uh, pheochromocytomas or something like it, a paraganglioma, and inherited. So we'll go through each of these. We'll really spend most of the time on MEN1 and MEN2. And MEN2 is something close to my heart because I spent three years in a laboratory working on it uh, back when I was a resident. And by the way, I didn't mention I'm a surgical oncologist from the University of Iowa. So uh, I'm a surgeon, but I also do uh, genetics research. So, uh, uh, and including my early stuff was working with MEN2 patients. So there are three different subtypes of MEN2. There's MEN2A, this is the most common. And virtually everybody with MEN2A will get medullary thyroid cancer. And this is a neuroendocrine tumor of the thyroid gland. They'll also get hyperparathyroidism, about 35 to 40% of them. And about 40% will get pheochromocytomas. This is, again, a, a tumor of the adrenal gland that makes adrenaline. Then the other subtype, which is even more virulent and aggressive and has a much younger age of onset, is called MEN2B. And here patients get medullary thyroid cancer, or MTC. They get pheochromocytomas, but instead of having hyperparathyroidism, they have this odd look to them. They have a marfanoid body habitus, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And they get mucosal neuromas, and uh, a very striking phenotype, and again, a very aggressive form of medullary thyroid cancer. And then there's a less aggressive form that's called familial medullary thyroid cancer, where they don't get the pheochromocytomas or the hyperparathyroidism, they just get medullary thyroid cancer. So the, this is a, a diagram from there that just shows the endocrine system. And you can see the various endocrine glands in the body. And when we talk about MEN2A, we're talking about the thyroid gland here. That's the medullary thyroid cancer component. The parathyroid glands, of which we have two on each side behind the thyroid in general. And when you have uh, MEN2A, or MEN1 for that matter, you have enlargement of all four parathyroid glands usually. And then finally, the uh, adrenal gland develops these tumors called pheochromocytomas. And we'll talk about each one of these components. Before we do that, this is a picture of that marfanoid body habitus in the gentleman on the left in A. These patients with MEN2B have very characteristic look to the lips. There's a proliferation of nerve fibers and collagen deposition. And uh, 
panel C shows some of these mucosal neuromas or a bumpy tongue that you'll see. It's a very characteristic phenotype and uh, it's often recognizable at birth. Now medullary thyroid cancer itself, which is the component of all three of these subtypes that, that's shared, is, uh, accounts for about 5 to 10% of all thyroid cancers. Most thyroid cancers are from the different cells, follicular <coughs> cells. These come from the C cells or parafollicular cells, which are neuroendocrine cells. And about 10 to 15% of cases that you'll see happen in members of these MEN2 families, whereas 80 to 90% are sporadic. And what we mean by sporadic is they happen in individuals who have no family history. It's a new onset of this tumor. And presumably no genetic predisposition, although we're learning more and more about them modifying loci now, and maybe they do have a predisposition, but not like in MEN2 where they're born with a single gene mutation. And again, as I mentioned, they come from the C cells of the thyroid gland, which are neuroendocrine. So the pathologic characteristics of medullary thyroid carcinoma is that the C cells populate the upper third of the thyroid gland. These tumors tend to be multifocal in multiple places within the thyroid. Uh, this shows a, a thyroid specimen on a patient that did prophylactic thyroidectomy, uh, who is a member of one of these MEN2 kindreds. And you can see the little yellow dots in the upper panel, which represents one tumor, and then in the isthmus and the lower uh, tissue sections, you see another. This is a multifocal tumor. These have unusual characteristics under the microscope. Dr. Mitros will tell you more about it, but they have an amyloid stroma. And that, uh, in the center panel, you can see the green birefringence that you get if you stain it with Congo red. And finally, if you stain it with the antibody for calcitonin, which is what these neuroendocrine cells make, you can highlight these cells and prove that it's a medullary thyroid cancer. Calcitonin is a hormone that lowers calcium levels in, in the blood, and it's a very good marker for these tumors. There is a precursor to the, to the uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma, it's called C-cell hyperplasia. And young individuals who have these, uh, who are born with this predisposition will start out with overgrowth of these cells which will later progress to cancer. The diagnosis of this tumor is made in family members uh, by physical exam. If patients are elderly and they've never been seen by a physician, they come in off the farm at age 50, they may have large thyroid mass. But nowadays, most people are pretty keyed into the fact that m multiple members of the families have had these tumors. And we can do a test called a basal calcitonin level. And so you can draw levels of calcitonin in the blood. And if somebody has a medullary thyroid cancer, it will usually be elevated. If patients are young and they have this family history, what we used to do is something called a stimulated calcitonin level. And there, what you do is you inject calcium and pentagastrin, and that will cause release of calcitonin. And you could diagnose patients even before they had cancer when they had this C cell hyperplasia. Unfortunately, pentagastrin has not been available for over a decade, and so you can't do that kind of testing anymore. However, the gene's been identified, and we'll talk more about it, and you can do genetic testing and figure out who's going to get this component well before it happens. Treatment of medullary thyroid cancer is to take out the thyroid. And this is a picture of a, of a thyroid gland. Uh, Trachea is situated underneath. You see it at the left would be the patient's head and at the right, the patient's foot. The thyroid gland is up top. And a couple technical points are that the nerve to your voice box, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, runs right behind the thyroid. And it's careful. It's important to carefully preserve that function. And the parathyroid glands also are attached to the back of the thyroid or in the vicinity of the thyroid. And they have a very fragile blood supply. And uh, normally we would preserve these in the thyroidectomy, but in patients with MEN2, since about a third of them get uh, hyperparathyroidism, you, you often will need to treat that as well. The other thing we do at the time of surgery is we do a central neck dissection. Uh, in other words, you remove the lymph nodes from the neck, from the hyoid bone up here, down to the sternal notch, and over to the carotid arteries. Now, this is what we do when patients have a medullary thyroid cancer. If we're doing it for prophylactic uh, thyroidectomy in a child where they haven't developed cancer yet, we wouldn't do that part of it. Now, I mentioned the parathyroid glands. About a third of patients have hyperparathyroidism. The parathyroid glands, again, very in normal situations, are very small glands that sit behind the thyroid. And in MEN2 patients, <clears throat> if you're doing a thyroidectomy, we generally would do uh, one of two things which I'll mention just in a second. But first, we should talk about the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism. And those symptoms are many-fold. 
parathyroid hormone uh, causes uh, increased calcium resorption from bones, from the kidney, and enhances intestinal absorption. And when these parathyroid glands get enlarged, they secrete an, an inappropriate amount of parathyroid hormone that causes the resorption of bone, which could lead to bone loss. It could lead to uh, kidney stones. People tend to be very fatigued. They may have psychiatric disturbances like depression or uh, confusion and abdominal pain, pancreatitis or ulcers. So when you have a patient with MEN 2A, if they have elevated calcium, then it's important to deal with that and you do a subtotal parathyroidectomy or a total parathyroidectomy with autotransplantation. What subtotal parathyroidectomy means is you take out three and a half of the four glands and leave one half of a gland in place in the neck. Total parathyroidectomy, you take out all four, and you cut one into little pieces and you implant it into the forearm muscle where it can reestablish itself. And the reason you do that is that these people get recurrent problems with this five or 10 years later and it's easier to take it out of the arm. Now the other component is pheochromocytoma. Now the, the adrenal glands are shown here. This is like, imagine looking through somebody's back with their spine removed. You see the kidneys and the yellow glands on top are the adrenal glands. Now, when these get enlarged, they get nodular, like uh, in this, this picture to the right. And again, these make adrenaline, and that can cause all sorts of problems. The biggest problem that people get into is they get really high blood pressure. It's not uncommon to have blood pressures well over 200, and members of MEN2 families have been known to just drop dead of a hypertensive crisis from bleeding into their brain. This is a patient I operated on recently. He's a 35-year-old mother of two who was diagnosed with uh, uh, anxiety disorder about a year earlier and placed on multiple medications. She also had bad migraines, and eventually she had a CT scan which showed this mass. I wish I had a pointer, but I don't. But you can see on the left, there's this large multilobulated mass, and on the right is another view. This is looking at the patient standing up, and you can see this mass under the liver, and that's a pheochromocytoma. And we took that out, and her symptoms, her symptoms resolved. The symptoms that people get from these are really uh, quite dramatic, and they often will have headaches, they'll have excess sweating, palpitations, anxiety, tremulousness, they can have chest pain, they can have a variety of the, all the symptoms listed on that slide. And again, hypertension is, is another thing that you'll see in these patients. <coughs> it's fairly dangerous. The treatment of this, well, it's a little tricky. Now, these patients with MEN2, they have thyroid cancer, they have pheochromocytomas. The critical thing is always treat the pheochromocytoma first. Because patients who have pheochromocytomas, they make a lot of adrenaline, and then they're in a chronic state of vasoconstriction. And when you're in vasoconstriction for a long time, your blood volume gets markedly reduced. So if you take out their pheochromocytoma, and you take out this adrenaline, they'll have a cardiovascular collapse after that operation. Also, if you operate on somebody's thyroid, you're gonna, you might have these huge swings of blood pressure. And a lot of people are diagnosed, like one lady who's, <coughs> went into cardiogenic shock after having back surgery and she had a pheochromocytoma. So little stressful situations can bring on a crisis. So to, to keep that from happening, you put them on a medicine called phenoxybenzamine, which causes blockade of those receptors that adrenaline binds to, gradually opens up the, the vessels and restores the plasma volume so you can safely operate on them a couple weeks later. So once you've done that, then you can progress to do an adrenalectomy. And if it's on one side, you take out one adrenal. You do, do fine with one adrenal gland. The other adrenal gland will take over. Generally, if the adrenal gland is over five centimeters, I would do an open adrenalectomy because the risk there of having cancer is higher than if it's less than five centimeter, where it's quite reasonable to do a laparoscopic adrenalectomy where you use smaller incisions. About half of the people in MEN families will develop a second pheochromocytoma on the other side but the mean interval to development of that may be about 12 years. And having zero adrenal glands is a kind of dangerous situation. You need to be on steroid supplements because the adrenals make cortisol, and that's important, and aldosterone as well. And those people are vulnerable to Addisonian crisis, which is uh, when they're exposed to stress, they, they can't make any cortisol, and they can uh, be in a life-threatening situation if they have no adrenal glands. So you put off a bilateral, taking out the other adrenal gland until you really have to. Now I'm going to diverge from MEN2 just briefly to talk about those two syndromes uh, with familial pheochromocytoma. And one was von Hippel-Lindau, and Dr. Warner uh, mentioned this earlier. And that's an interesting syndrome where patients were born with mutation in, in the VHL gene, 
and they get a variety of interesting things. They get CNS hemangioblastomas. Those are brain tumors or cerebellar tumors. They get hemangiomas in the back of their eyes, and a lot of people will go blind from these things rupturing. They get tumors of the kidney and cysts of the kidney, and similar situation in the pancreas, pancreatic islet cells and pancreatic cysts. And they get pheochromocytoma in about 27% of patients. The other syndrome is von Recklinghausen's disease, or neurofibromatosis. And here, patients get a variety of interesting uh, anomalies. One is called cafe au lait spots. And this large pigmented area in the center is an example of that. They also get axillary or inguinal freckles. And you see those all around that cafe au lait spot. And they may have two or more neurofibromas. And this is what a neurofibroma looks like. Uh, they think that the elephant man had, had this disease. Um, they may also get leash nodules. These are in your iris. These are little tiny nodules in the iris in your eye. They can get bone lesions and again, optic gliomas, but pheochromocytomas. But they only get those in about 5 to 10% of cases. All right, well, let's go back to MEN2 for a second. Let's talk a little bit about the genetics, because this is really where a lot of progress has been made in, in MEN2. And that is, and that all began in 1987 with genetic studies that localized the gene for, uh, for MEN2 to chromosome 10. And those were done with big families, and back then we would map genetic markers to different chromosomes, and we knew that it was near the middle of chromosome 10. And in 1993, Dr. Wells and Dr. Donis Keller, which is a lab I worked in, uh, identified RET as the, the gene that caused MEN2A. And also another group in England, Bruce Ponder's group at Cambridge, figured this out at the same time. And a year later, our, our laboratory also discussed uh, the fact that MEN2B was caused by a different mutation in the same gene. And then groups found that Hirschsprung's disease, which is a disease where patients are born without ganglion cells in the colon, uh, is also caused by that and mutations in that gene. Now this just shows the red gene product. This is a protein on the cell surface and those two dots in the middle represent the cell membrane and the part above is the, what we call the extracellular domain of RET. And this binds ligands like glial derived neurotrophic factor. And then when that binds, it signals through the molecule and inside the cell it it transfers a phosphate group that activates uh, a certain pathway. The mutations that are seen in patients with MEN2A are shown with the ellipses there. It's hard, kind of hard to see them, but they're by the membrane. And then in MEN2B, uh, that diamond-shaped thing at 918 down below. Now, this shows the power of genetic analysis. And, and, and now that we know the gene, and this was a study that Dr. Wells and our group did in 1994, you can take a family, and this family, and you see the top of the figure, the people with half-shaded means that they've had medullary thyroid cancer, and there are four of those people in the top two generations. In the lowest generations, you see five different uh, symbols, five different offspring, and we don't know if they have medullary thyroid cancer or not, or whether they're going to get it or not, they're too young. Well, we can do gene testing, and that's shown in the upper panel on the right, and everybody with that extra band at the lower of those two bands uh, is, has the mutated RET gene. And you can see of the people in the lowest generations that individuals 4, 7, and 8 have that mutated gene, whereas individual 3 and individual 9 do not. So you know that person number 3 and person number 9 is not going to get medullary thyroid cancer, and then they don't need to be screened for it. They can, uh, you know, not have to be tested, whereas 4, 7, and 8 are definitely going to get it. And depending on which mutation they have, they're going to need their thyroid out prophylactically before they develop cancer. And this was the first example of prophylactic surgery for a genetic diagnosis. And Dr. Wells should be given a lot of credit for his foresight in this area. And he continues to be working in the forefront of treatment of the patients with metastatic uh, medullary thyroid cancer. And this just shows that the gene once again uh, lined up. Uh, the membrane would be in the, in the middle. And it just shows on the right different risks of different mutations in the gene. The mutations that are found in patients that have MEN2B are the most significant. Those are people who will get the disease within the first few years of life. And that's at 918 and 883. And when somebody has MEN2B, you 
you may recognize it at birth, they should have genetic testing right away, and they should have their thyroid out within the first six months of life, because they will get thyroid cancer within the first few years of life. And it's very difficult to cure once they've developed lymph node metastases. So you can take out the thyroid at birth, and these people can live longer lives. The next highest risk mutations are those shown in blue. The codon 634 mutation is pretty common in MEN2A, and it's associated with a high incidence of pheochromocytoma and hyperparathyroidism. And those people with the blue mutations, they should have their thyroid out by age five. People who are at intermediate risk, those, uh, the other colors shown there, they can wait to age five, 10, or 15, depending on the specific mutation. So again, this has been uh, just a, a real advance, knowing the genetic uh, predisposition to the, these thyroid cancers, we're, we're able to cure these people, but before we would, it was very difficult to cure them. And this is just an algorithm that uh, we came up with about 10 years ago for, for how to manage members of MEN2A families. Uh, and you start with physical exam and a history, and then we do biochemical testing for the three different components, hyperparathyroidism, you check a calcium and a parathyroid hormone level. For the adrenaline of the pheochromocytoma, you check serum metanephrine levels. Back then it was 24-hour urines, but it's easier to do this plasma test now. And then um, for the uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma, you can do calcitonin testing. But also, you do the genetic testing. If they have the mutation, they're gonna have prophylactic thyroidectomy. And again, it's very important to make sure that these patients don't have that pheochromocytoma before you take out the thyroid. Again, because that will lead to a lot of problems if, they, if that's not treated first. Well, now we're going to talk about MEN1. Now, the names sound pretty similar, and they do share one thing, and that's the hyperparathyroidism. But after that, they're very different. The most common thing you'll see is hyperparathyroidism. The vast majority of patients with MEN1 will get that component. About two-thirds will get pancreatic islet cell tumors. About, uh, about half will get pituitary tumors. And then about 15, 16% will get adrenocortical tumors, carcinoids, and lipomas. The carcinoids they get are not the mid-get carcinoids, but really more uh, bronchial carcinoids and gastric carcinoids for the most part. And this is actually a, a group of 130 patients that were evaluated at the NIH. And you can see that 99% of the patients that uh, they wrote up in this study had hyperparathyroidism. Two thirds had neuroendocrine tumors, of which the most common is gastrinoma. Second most common is insulinoma, followed by the non functional tumors. And about half had pituitary tumors, of which the most common is a prolactinoma. Uh, and then the second most common is the non functional tumors. Again, 16% of carcinoids, 16% had adrenocortical tumors, most of those being non-functional. They're not pheochromocytomas like in MEN2, but adrenocortical from the other part of the adrenal, not the one that makes adrenaline, but more the one that makes cortisol or aldosterone. And finally, some of those patients will get thyroid tumors, but again, this is a different type, not medullary, but papillary. So we're back to the parathyroid glands. You saw this figure earlier. Again, almost everybody's going to get hyperparathyroidism. So these patients, you're not going to take out their thyroid. They don't get medullary thyroid cancer. But you're going to take out the parathyroids. And again, the treatment of choice is either a subtotal parathyroidectomy, where you take out three and a half glands and leave one half in the neck, or the total parathyroidectomy with autotransplantation. Again, within five or 10 years, it's very likely that whatever you leave in the body is going to get big again, because of the germline mutation that these people are born with that causes those cells to enlarge again and secrete high amounts of parathyroid hormone. So just plan on you know, making a date in five or 10 years to, to do something again. And it's easier to do it if it's in the, in the forearm, but either one of those techniques is acceptable. What about pituitary tumors? Well, I don't operate on the brain, so we won't spend a lot of time on it, but the pituitary gland is at the base of the brain, shown here on the left. Here's some MRIs that show pituitary tumors. In the right panel, they're colored in red, and you can see at the top panel there's a microadenoma. That's a four millimeter tumor. The middle panel shows a two and a half centimeter tumor, and the lower panel shows a huge five centimeter tumor. And these tumors in MEM1 usually will make prolactin, which is, can cause galacteria, or milky discharge from the breast. It can cause infertility or in amenorrhea. And then some of these are non-functional and others can make other hormones. Let's talk about islet cell tumors because that, that's really something that uh, overlaps a lot with uh, a lot of people in the audience have PNETs and 
This is very apropos. Let's talk about the pancreas a little bit and what it does. We talked about how the pancreas is both an exocrine and an endocrine organ. Exocrine means that it has a duct and it has secretions that drain through the duct and that's the digestive enzymes that most of the cells in the pancreas make. The other cells shown in the bottom right uh, in the color there make different hormones. Insulin, VIP, glucagon, uh, and a variety of other hormones. That's the endocrine function. Those are hormones that are released into the blood, whereas the exocrine part, the digestive enzymes, they're released into the duct. And on the left, you can see some of the complexity of the organ. You can see the, the duct of the, uh, I guess I do have a pointer. You can see the, the duct of the pancreas here. The common bile duct runs through the back of the pancreas, and the, the head of the pancreas is intimately associated with the duodenum. So that makes surgery of the head a little more complicated than doing things out in the tail. So this is what an islet cell tumor looks like under the microscope. That central blob, that's the tumor. And if you look at it in higher power, you'll see some normal islet cells on the right. And then there's the capsule of the tumor in the middle. And there's the tumor itself on the left. Now these tumors, as you heard before, can be non-functional. That means that they don't make high levels of a hormone or they don't give rise to a syndrome or a specific group of symptoms. But in MEN1, the most common of these types is going to be gastrinoma. That makes high levels of gastrin leading to peptic ulcers. Insulinoma is the second most common here. People release a lot of insulin and they get low blood sugars. Glucogonomas can cause diabetes in a, a uh, migratory necrolytic rash, and VIP almost, you get a watery diarrhea syndrome and low potassium, and then uh, also they can make ACTH and give, give rise to Cushing syndrome. Now this is a study that looked at the SEER database, which is a national database, and so this isn't specific to MEM1, this is people with sporadic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and the vast majority, if you look on the upper left, are non-functional. 7% are classified as carcinoid, and I'm not sure exactly what that means. I, I doubt they check serotonin levels on these 9,000 patients, but maybe they had diarrhea and they were classified as such. But then you see that the next most common is gastronoma and insulinoma. Now let's just talk a little bit about these functional tumors, and especially the ones that you see in MEN1. And we'll start with gastronoma. You, people have already alluded to what gastronoma is. Uh, gives rise to this thing called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Dr. Odoricio worked with Robert Zollinger and uh, Ed Ellison at OSU, basically in 1955, described two patients that had genital ulcers and pancreatic tumors. And they also had uh, ulcers in weird locations in the second and third part of the duodenum or even lower down in the jejunum. And they had gastric acid hypersecretion and they had islet cell tumors. And that's why gastronoma uh, has been named the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome because of that paper in 1955. If we look at gastronoma in the population, it happens about three cases per million people per year, very uncommon. About 75% of cases are sporadic, again, with no family history, and then 25% happen in patients that are members of MEM1 families. The majority of these are gonna be malignant tumors. And usually patients have had symptoms for five to seven years prior to the diagnosis, which will include abdominal pain, heartburn, diarrhea, and then bleeding perforation and gastric outlet obstruction, which are common symptoms with ulcers. <clears throat> now gastronomas are not just in the pancreas. We're talking mostly about pancreatic tumors, but they actually happen a lot in the duodenum. And this is a study of 91 patients, of which about half of them were in the duodenum. And all those little dots signify the locations of different patients' gastronomas. And there's something called the gastronoma triangle, which goes from the common bile duct to the second, third portion of duodenum to the halfway across the pancreas, and that's where the vast majority of these tumors are gonna be. But they can be very hard to find, and I think this was mentioned earlier, that they can often be, I think Dr. Mitros mentioned that they can be very, very tiny and difficult to find, and yet cause these profound symptoms. So the diagnosis is by finding of gastric hypersecretion, they usually have fasting gastrin levels over 500. And if you give secretin, again, this is also difficult to get these days, but when you could get it, it would cause a, a significant increase in gastrin. And once you make that diagnosis, then you've got to find where the tumor is. And again, if the tumor is really small, 
you may not be able to localize it. CAT scan can show, CAT scan or CT computer tomography can show these lesions if they're over about a centimeter. Our CT scanners are, are a little better than the ones in Ireland where they can only find 1.5 centimeter tumors, Dr. Ardell mentioned earlier. But, uh, so about a centimeter is our threshold. Actually, with the really good pancreatic protocol CT, you might see things as small as five to seven millimeters. Endoscopic ultrasound, where they put a, a scope down somebody that has an ultrasound probe on it. You can look at the wall of the duodenum and the pancreas. That, that's a decent way to look for them. Uh, TRIA scans, really only going to be positive if the tumor is pretty large. Again, even a centimeter may or may not show up. But a few centimeters are very likely to show up on a TRIA scan. And then these other three things are things that you can do intraoperatively. Once you've made the diagnosis of gastrinoma, you can do these things at surgery. And I'll just elaborate a little bit with this next picture. You can put a scope down and you can illuminate from inside the duodenum. And you might see these little nodules that you'll know to go after. Furthermore, you can make a, an incision in the duodenum, make a little incision here and put your finger in to try to palpate these small lesions. And finally, you can mobilize the pancreas as shown on the right here and then do intraoperative ultrasound to find these tumors. Now, to manage gastrinomas, and in MEM1, they tend to be multifocal, and that makes it harder to cure these things because you, you can take out the tumor you see, but a few years later, you may have another one. Or maybe there's some smaller ones you didn't even find. And so they may continue to have problems with high gastrin levels. So these patients are usually treated with either uh, H2 blockers like famotidine or PPIs, protein pump inhibitors like omeprazole. That can control the gastric acid hypersecretion. And if that doesn't work, you can take out the stomach and that will remove the end organ that makes acid. It's a little radical, but that used to be commonly employed back uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. If it's an MEN1 patient, if they have hyperparathyroidism, you should deal with their hyperparathyroidism first because that excess calcium will cause increased gastric acid production. And then finally, if you can find the tumor, you should remove it. And it depends on how big the tumor is, where it is, but you have several different op options if it's in the pancreas, and that includes enucleation, distal pancreatectomy, and a pancreatic duodenectomy or Whipple procedure, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. Before we do that, though, let's just talk a little bit about insulinoma. That's the other major common tumor in the N1. And the insulin was discovered in 1922 by Banting and Best, and they got the Nobel Prize for that. And then in 1927 it was the first case report of somebody with an insulinoma. Uh, in 1929 was the first report of actually removing successfully <coughs> insulinoma and cure of that of the symptoms. And in 1935, Whipple, the guy who we're going to talk about his procedure in a little bit, he actually came up with the, the clinical description of, uh, of, of the syndrome of patients with insulinoma. Now what happens with people with insulinoma is they make too much insulin and uh, that'll cause blurred vision, confusion, amnesia as your blood sugar drops. People just kind of start to lose consciousness, go into a coma, they act weird, and they may have seizures. And also when you get a low blood sugar, your adrenal glands will start pumping out adrenaline and that'll cause you to sweat and be anxious, have weakness and tremor, hunger, nausea, and palpitations. So very characteristic symptoms that you'll see in patients with these tumors, which can be immediately reversed by administration of glucose. Now the diagnosis that Whipple came up with uh, way back in the 30s was that patients who are fasting especially will get symptoms of low blood sugar. If you measure their blood sugar, it'll be low, less than 50. And if you give glucose, it'll reverse their symptoms. And that diagnosis has become a little more sophisticated now, where what we'll do is we'll make people fast for 72 hours, and sometime before you get to 72 hours, they'll start getting very hypoglycemic. You'll, you'll check their blood sugar, it'll be less than 40. Their insulin level will be over 40. They'll have high levels of C-peptide, which is part of the insulin molecule that isn't given uh, when people take insulin shots, and also an absence of oral diabetes medicine in their bloodstream. So if you, if you do that kind of testing and you come up with a diagnosis of insulinoma, you have the same problem that we mentioned for gastrinoma. You've got to find the tumor now. Now these things are, are in the pancreas. In MEN1 patients, they can be multiple and very small. In patients who don't have MEN1, they may be larger and easier to find. And we would normally start with a pancreatic protocol CT, which shows the pancreas very well. You can see one centimeter lesions very well. A TRIA scan, again, not, not so good unless the tumors are large. 
Angiography, uh, it can be useful because these tumors have a rich blood supply and when you squirt uh, uh, an angiogram, you'll see a proliferation of blood vessels and you can even in, uh, cannulate the blood vessels going to different parts of the pancreas, inject calcium and check for levels of uh, insulin in the hepatic vein behind that and diagnose in somebody whether the tumor is in the head, the body, or tail of the pancreas. And finally, intraoperative ultrasound is another way to, to find these tumors. This shows a CT scan of a patient that I saw a few years ago who had had symptoms of uh, every few hours she would start feeling lightheaded and faint, and then if she would eat something, then she'd feel better right away. And uh, she had gained about 50 pounds over the last couple of years. CT scan shows that in the tail of the pancreas, she has this lobular mass. She had a triotide scan which confirmed it. You see that black area? The two other black areas are the kidneys below and the bladder low down and the liver is on the left. But where the arrow is, that's this tumor taking up the triotide. This is an angiogram and again shows this blush in the lower left of the picture. That's a, a proliferation of blood vessels that will show you where an ion cell tumor is. And then on the right, we show intraoperative ultrasound. You hold the pancreas in your hand, you run an ultrasound probe over it, and you can find lesions as small as just three to five millimeters that way. So the surgical treatment options, as I mentioned for gastronoma, would be enucleation, distal pancreatectomy for tumors in the tail, and then pancreatic duodenectomy or Whipple procedure for tumors in the head. And this just shows enucleation. And so the, you see the pancreas, and at the bottom is this round lesion here. And what you do is you essentially shell it out. And then you end up with kind of a cavity there. And this is a picture of a patient with an insuloma I operated on, and you can see the tumor. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I hope you can see it. Uh, the arrow's pointing to it now. It's that white thing right here. This is a superior mesenteric vein pulled out of the way. And we just shelled this out, and that cured that patient of their insulinoma. Some, this is another patient with a non-functional tumor, and this is much larger. And this is in the body of the pancreas, and you can't enucleate this, but you're going to do an operation where you divide the pancreas to the left of, on the screen of where the tumor is and, and take that out with usually with the spleen. There's a tumor right there and this is kind of a, a diagram of what that procedure is. You free up the pancreas posteriorly, you divide it, and you take out the tumor. And usually a big tumor like this you would have to take out the spleen because the splenic vein runs right through the, the back of the pancreas and usually it's thrombose from the tumor. This shows, just shows a pathological specimen of somebody like this, and there's a spleen on the right, there's a tumor, and there's a good one centimeter margin on the left. Now, this is a patient with a neuroendocrine tumor with a, which is in the head of the pancreas. There's the tumor, and there's the superior mesenteric vein right above it. Now, this is the part of the pancreas where the bile duct runs in. This is where the pancreatic duct empties into the duodenum. And here, you have to do a much bigger operation. You have to do a pancreatic duodenectomy. And what you do is you divide the pancreas, as I showed before, but you take the stuff on the other side of the vein, which includes the duodenum, the bile duct, the gallbladder, and, uh, and part of the stomach, usually. And this is what the specimen looks like. You see the duodenum and the pancreatic head. Uh, if it was that patient I just showed you on the CT scan, his tumor was about eight times that big. And once you take all that out, you've got to put things back together. And this is an intraoperative photo. I, it shows that the bile duct is up here, the pancreatic duct has this tube going into it, those have to be hooked up, and then the stomach has been divided up here, and that has to be hooked up. And what you do is you bring up the jejunum and you sew it to the bile duct here, the pancreas here, and the stomach here. It's a pretty big operation and it's uh, definitely more involved than, say, a distal pancreatectomy or enucleation. So is it worth resecting patients? Well, this is a pretty good study, again, looking at the SEER database, and it looked at hundreds of patients in the United States with uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and looked at the, the two curves I want you to concentrate on are the two on the right. And these are patients who all were resection candidates and either had resection done versus it was recommended, but they didn't have it done. And you see the curve at the right, the survival was 114 months in those patients who had resection, whereas it was only 35 months in those patients who didn't have resection. So clearly in this retrospective series, there's clear advantage to having resection of your primary. 
We look at the subset of patients who have liver metastases, and this is not uncommon, for, especially with you patients with peanuts out there. A lot of people have this situation with metastatic disease to the liver. There still seems to be some survival advantage to patients who can have the primary resected even in the face of liver metastases. And in this same study, they looked again at the group of patients who had resection recommended versus not recommended with liver metastases. And the median survival was 60 months for those patients who had resection versus only 31 months who didn't have resection. So again, this is retrospective data, but it still suggests that it, taking out the primary may uh, lead to longer survival. And this isn't always possible, but when it is possible, it's, it may be that these primary tumors are continuing to seed the liver, and that taking out the primary may set back the clock somewhat. But, if, you know, the other thing is resection of liver metastases, or at least debulking of them, that can also have a survival advantage, but it's important to recognize that about 95% of people who have disease in the liver, even if you take it out or debulk it, will get recurrent disease again. And this is a CAT scan of a guy I resected liver, a solitary liver met on 64 months ago, who now has three new liver lesions that weren't there a year ago, but now you see several different liver lesions. So this is going to happen frequently, and so often patients may not be cured, but you can slow down the disease. So I'm going to finish my talk by talking about the genetics of MEN1. We talked about MEN2. The situation there is very clear. In MEN1, it's not quite as crystal clear, but Similar things have been done with MEN1 as MEN2. In 1987 and 1989, we figured out that the locus or the chromosome that the gene was on was chromosome 11. And it took about 10 years when finally the people at the NIH discovered that the gene called menin uh, was, the, was the gene that was inherited that was mutated by the patients with MEN1. Now this is a gene that uh, is a 600 codes for a 622 uh, 10 amino acid protein that's mostly in the nucleus, and its job is to uh, inhibit GUNA-D and NF-kappa-B, which usually cause proliferation. So this gene is a tumor suppressor gene, and what it does is it keeps proliferation by happening by binding to these other proteins. The gene itself, uh, unlike the MEN2 gene, where there are just about 10, 15 different mutations that people get. In MEN1, people get mutations throughout the gene. And there's no good prediction you can make based upon where the mutation is and how bad the disease is they're going to get, whether they get pancreatic eyelid cell tumors or whether they get the other components of the MEN1. So the algorithm for treating patients who are at risk for MEN1 is shown here. You basically will take family members and you'll do biochemical screening. So for hyperparathyroidism, again, calcium and parathyroid hormone. For pituitary lesions, a prolactin level, and you can check a variety of other hormones. And, a, and also an MRI of the brain is helpful for that. And then for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we check a, a variety of different hormones, gastrin, insulin, pancreatic polypeptide. CAT scans can be done uh, as well to look for those lesions as patients get older. If somebody has any one of those laboratory abnormalities are elevated, then that should be followed up on. And genetic testing should be done uh, to figure out if those people are carriers, because if they don't carry the mutated gene, they don't need to have the screening done all the time. If they're a gene carrier, or if they have elevated levels of calcium, they, they will probably require parathyroidectomy at some point. The pancreatic tumors can be dangerous as well, and usually as those enlarge and get over two centimeters or so, they should be removed. And pituitary tumors, if they're small, a lot of times patients can be treated uh, medically with bromocryptine if they make prolactin, but as they enlarge, they may need to be removed surgically or treated with radiation. But one of the big differences between MEN and MEN2 is shown here, that there's really no role for prophylactic surgery for asymptomatic patients with MEN1. You're basically going to have the biochemical diagnosis and find that they have a tumor before you take it out, whereas in MEN2, you're going to take out the thyroid gland at a young age before they get uh, a, a worse cancer. So I want to thank you very much for your attention and allowing me to speak to you today.